All right. Good morning, folks. We'll get started. Thanks for the folks that are actually in here. Hope that we'll be back and having a crowd in the next week or two if the governor releases us. So we shall see. All right. We good? All right. Remember, guys, there's about a 15 second delay. If you have questions, oh, you're fine. Reach out on the uh, chat feature. We can answer those questions for you. Um, this is EMS Challenge, started several years ago for those of y'all that are new to the program, basically to provide uh, uh, appropriate uh, con ed to EMS providers in the Brems region. Um, you can go to our Facebook page and kind of read about that, but the goal is to increase con ed throughout the state to increase um, uh, the patient care, improve the patient care that we provide. So for your certificate today, at the end of the class, before two o'clock, email Alabama EMS Challenge. When you email that, you will get a reply. You fill out the form, put in your information, and that generates your certificate. That should be mailed out within the week. Try to get these back to us by 2 o'clock this afternoon if you can. But it's Alabama EMS Challenge at gmail.com is how you get your con ed. So a couple of things for the Brims region. Just want to kind of update. I know we had an MDAC last week. Most of that was focused around COVID. Um, things I want to talk about and the protocols that were up for revision were approved by the state. They will be released sometime mid-June uh, in writing, but in short, uh, basic EMTs can now use blind insertion devices such as a, a King or an iGel. Okay, those are probably the two better options. Uh, there will be some education coming out with that. I'll do some uh, work on that before June through EMS Challenge. Um, if you have a question about this or you want to set up a training session for your agency, reach out to me at BRIMS. We can do that. I'll also put some videos online uh, at the BRIMS webpage at the state level to kind of explain those, but fairly easy to use, low risk, high yield. TXA, which has been in our protocol, uh, is category B uh, for hemodynamic uh, instability with uh, bleeding. Uh, it's going to be changed to category A and the dose will be one gram. We'll talk about that in the case in a few minutes, uh, but that'll be coming out as well. Um, TXA is a pretty good drug. It's been an optional drug to carry. If you don't carry it, uh, I recommend start thinking about getting that. Uh, it's a low cost but high yield drug, especially if you're not carrying blood products. Our cadaver lab, we had a cancel last week. I'll reschedule that as soon as I can. Um, once UAB classrooms open and I can reach the guy that runs a surgical lab, I'll get us a date for that. Um, COVID updates, uh, that's being covered everywhere. Not going to do a lot of details about that. At the end of the lecture, if we have time, I will kind of address what American Heart put out a few weeks ago as far as resuscitation in the COVID uh, time of COVID. Uh, the other thing I want to mention today is diversion. So I've had several calls over the past couple of weeks about diversion. Remember, um, for the EMS providers, diversion uh, is just a suggestion that the hospital is too busy to accept people. It is not a, uh, a cold stop or a hard stop with that. If a patient wants to go to a hospital A and hospital A is on diversion, you let them know at that hospital there may be a delay in care, maybe some wall time. Um, if they go there, uh, they can still go to a hospital that's on diversion. All right. Things I'd recommend pushing if the patient is an attached to a hospital, for example, they have uh, uh, cancer treatments at a hospital, or they've just had surgery at a hospital that's on diversion, I would still recommend they go to that hospital. Most of the nurse management, most of the hospital administration in the Brims region is agreeable with this, okay? Because uh, it's better if someone just had surgery at hospital A to go to hospital A, even if they're on diversion, okay? Now that's not overload. Sometimes hospitals have a uh, some kind of active shooter situation, or a uh, problem with the CT scans and they stop all traffic and that's walk-in and EMS, that's a different situation, but that's not what we routinely see. So remember, diversion is a suggestion, um, uh, not a hard stop from going there. Any questions about diversion, please reach out to me. Um, my contact information is on the BRIMS webpage. It's also on Facebook. All right, so we're gonna talk about 12 leads and then we'll talk about some uh, OBGYN emergencies. Uh, and we'll try to separate it out uh, in about 40 minutes for each. So 12 leads, a lot of people talk about 12 leads uh, being uh, the end all know all. A 12 lead EKG is a screening exam. It tells you if someone is sick or not sick. It gives you some data, but it's just one tool to use in your belt. It's not the, the all knowing information, okay? When I think about 12 leads, I think about breaking it down to easy interpretation. We good? 
Okay. Um, and looking at ventricular rate, is it too fast, too slow, or okay-ish? Too fast, I kind of like the American Hearts patho, the way they kind of run this down, wide versus narrow, regular and irregular. We'll talk about some of that today. Too slow, things to think about are drugs, electrolytes, or ischemia. And by drugs, we talk about calcium channel blockers, beta blockers, uh, things that most folks in the deep south are on for their hypertension. Electrolytes is hyperkalemia, and then ischemia will be a STEMI or some other type of cardiac dysrhythmia, cardiac event. <clears throat> Anything else uh, that causes a, somebody to get bradycardic, you pick up in your primary exam, okay, your A, B, and Cs. And then OK-ish, and these are the complicated or non-complicated. The big thing we're going to talk about around here is STEMI versus non-STEMI, with the goal in the next year or so is moving away from and using the 12 lead interpretation on your machine and the medics actually looking at the patient, looking at the 12 lead and making that decision. This is a STEMI or not a STEMI, the same way we do in the hospital. We'll also talk about some drug effects on EKGs throughout the course of the year, um, TCAs, which is a type of medication that you can overdose on, and then functional use of AVR. So there are several things we're going to talk about. Um, one of the goals to, or keys to adult learning is repetition. So uh, we'll address one of those three categories every time we do EMS challenge, okay? Things you got to know cold, know how to calculate a rate on a 12 lead on the paper. On the monitor, you can always look at the monitor. If it's a regular rhythm, most time you can trust that. If not, you put your hand on the pulse and you get the heart rate. But you should be able to calculate a heart rate on the paper as well, not just trust the machine. I use the box method, which is uh, 300, 150, which is 300, 150, 175, okay? <clears throat> if I start getting above six or seven boxes, then I start thinking the rate is too slow, all right? But this is a quick way to kind of get your rate with these EKGs. The next thing you gotta know is uh, intervals. So we all learned in medic school, PR interval, right? If a prolonged PR is a type one, uh, so a first degree heart block. Um, in reality, first degree heart blocks are not scary at all. They don't cause any big pathology. If I see a wide PR, the first thing I think about, though, is hyperkalemia. That's a telltale sign of hyperkalemia as well, especially in the Deep South where we practice where you got a lot of kidney disease and diabetes. But you got to know your intervals. PR interval, QRS to determine if it's wide or narrow to kind of go down that pathway. Is this a VTAC dysrhythmia or is it an AFib or an SVT? And then the last thing is the QT interval. There are a lot of medications out there that prolong the QT. QT interval from Q to T should be less than half the R to wherever the next R wave is, or QRS complex. If it's more than half of that, you think the pr prone to going into torsades or VTAC. So very concerning. There's one drug that we carry uh, in EMS that we use probably every shift that prolongs the QT that's probably relatively safe, except for people who have underlying long QT syndrome or people who are on other QT prolongating medications. And what drug is that? Anybody know in here? It's not a big crowd. So Zofran. So Zofran prolongs the QT. So if you got somebody that's already on a bunch of antipsychotic medicines, medications that prolong the QT or cardiac medicines, medications that prolong the QT, and you give Zofran, there's a risk of torsades. That doesn't mean you get a 12 lead on every person that's nauseous. <clears throat> But in reality, if it's an older person with nausea, you should consider ACS and get a quick 12 lead and look at that QRS interval. So that's really the only big contraindication to Zofran is a long QT. <clears throat> Any questions from internet land? If so, just put it on the chat box. <clears throat> so 12 leads, this one, I look at the rate and I'm gonna use my interpretation. Is it too fast, too slow or okay? All right, so I got 300, 150, 100, about 75, all right? So machine agrees with us, all right? So rate 75, rate is okay-ish. The next thing I start doing is I look at injury patterns first because obviously STEMIs get you off the wall and it's also appropriate to get these folks treated pretty quickly. So I look for lateral injuries. Lateral is leads one, AVL, and V5 and six. I'm looking for ST elevation. Elevation means ischemia, heart muscle dying, our T-wave inversion, ST depression is ischemia. The heart is hypoxic or for some reason not getting the nutrients it needs. So one, AVL, V5 and six. <clears throat> the next thing I'm gonna do is I'm gonna look uh, inferior, which is our two, three and AVF. All right, I'm looking for elevation or depression. The next place I'm gonna go look is I'm gonna look at V1 through V4. And these are our septal leads here. 
run down the middle of the heart, the septal. <clears throat> and then V3 and V4 are our anterior leads, or the front part of the heart. So these kind of all kind of run together. So septal anterior, looking for elevation, which is uh, a, a sign of a STEMI, right? And you got to have two consecutive leads, two of those four. All right. The other thing is if you have T wave inversion, ST depression in any of these leads, particularly V2, 3, and 4, you think about this being a posterior infarct. So if V3 and V4 are anterior leads, if we have ST depression, T wave inversion on lows, looking at the back side of the heart, it's going to be a posterior infarct. <clears throat> now, there are a lot of blogs out there, a lot of uh, places teaching to do posterior EKGs. So if you see this, what you do is you take your leads off the front and you run them across the back. So you take V2, or excuse me, uh, yeah, V1, V2, V3, 4, 5, and 6, and run them on the back, and you're looking for ST elevation. And that's pretty cool if you got time and you got 12 hands and you're sitting outside the cath lab. But in reality, this makes the diagnosis, T wave inversion, ST uh, depression. I would not recommend do, doing posterior EKGs in the field. I don't even do them in the ER anymore. <clears throat> and this cardiology is at bedside, waiting to go to the cath lab, and they want to do it. This makes my diagnosis. I'm not going to change anything if I put the posterior leads on this person and they don't show ST elevation. This guy's going to the cath lab, seeing a cardiologist regardless. So that's enough data. The last place I look is lead AVR. And for years we learned that the only thing AVR was good for was if you're up in one, you should be down in AVR. And if you're up in one and down in AVR, your leads are on correctly. <clears throat> that's true for the most part. In reality though, if you have ST elevation and lead AVR, and you got depression anywhere else in an injury pattern, okay? Usually it's gonna be V1 through V4, or it's gonna be lateral, which is your one, AVL, and five and six. You think about a left main. So you think about the heart, right? I'm a great artist. The heart, this will be the aorta coming off. The right coronary comes off that cusp. The left coronary comes off that cusp. <clears throat> if you have a big infarct right there, off that cusp of the aortic valve, okay, you're going to get elevation in AVR with depression everywhere else. So it is a STEMI equivalent, okay. Now, some people who are older have known heart disease, they got calcification in this main vessel coming off the, uh, the left uh, 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 aortic arch there, <clears throat> and they get stressed out from sepsis or hypotension, the heart rate gets up, you see that this AVR slowly creeps up, and you start getting depression, and that's called a strain pattern. And you may see that on some of the blogs online. But elevation in AVR, depression anywhere else, <clears throat> you think is a STEMI equivalent. Those guys should be put in the STEMI system. They should see a cardiologist, and this we can find the underlying reason for them not to go to the cath lab. <clears throat> My most recent case was an elderly woman who was anticoagulated, having chest pain, difficulty breathing, but she was also having a GI bleed, so she was anemic. And that's why she was having chest pain and short of breath and weak. And you can just see that her EKG was changing if she had blood loss, up in AVR, down everywhere else. She didn't need blood thinners, more blood thinners. She didn't need an IV, I mean, an angiogram and a heart cath. What she needed was fluid resuscitation and blood products and to reverse her Coumadin level. We did that, and you see her AVR elevation going down, the strain pattern, T wave inversions going back up. So the last thing I do after I look at injury patterns is I go back and I look <clears throat> for intervals in my PR looks normal, QRS looks normal, QT looks normal, all right? <clears throat> when I'm done with that, I go back one last time and I look <clears throat> for injury patterns, which is going to be one AVL lateral, two, three in AVF, V1 through V4, and the last place I look is AVR. And I do that because <clears throat> there's some days I've worked way too many hours and I get tired and I don't want to miss a STEMI. So I look at that 12 lead, my mind goes, is the rate too fast, too slow, or okay-ish? <clears throat> If the rate is okay-ish between 50 and 150, then I'm gonna go look injury patterns. One AVL lateral, two, three AVF, V1 through V4, quick peek at AVR. I'm gonna check my intervals. And then before I put it down, I'll look one more time for injury patterns. All right, <clears throat> it's pretty sad if you miss one of these big obvious ones just because you're tired. <clears throat> Questions from the internet or from the classroom within reason? Good. This is just a diagram I've shown numerous times. I swapped it off the internet. It's pretty nice, kind of shows the injury pattern. So it talks about AVR being close to the aorta, RCA coming off, or it goes down to left main, which runs septal anterior. 
most people <clears throat> have a circumflex artery that comes off the LAD that covers the lateral part of the heart. Some people, about 40%, have this circumflex that comes off this right coronary. So sometimes you'll see a lateral with a big septal anterior, and sometimes you'll see a lateral with the inferior. Sometimes you just see a lateral on its own because the infarct is beyond the left main. <clears throat> the only way you get better at 12 leads, guys, is to look at lots of them. So if you're not seeing 20 or 40 a shift, you're not seeing enough. So online, Life in the Fast Lane is a good web page. Wave Maven is a good web page. There are lots of them out there, <clears throat> but you got to see a lot of them. All right, so too fast. Let's talk about this one. So this was somebody that's weak. The uh, pulse is palpable for, by first responders, but pretty fast. They couldn't count. Respirations are slightly tachypneic. Sats are fine. Blood pressure is good. Of course, in Alabama, that's really hypotensive. Nobody has a real blood pressure anymore. Everybody's hyper, right? But D-stick is good. Remember, D-stick always gives you some good data. If you're starting a line on somebody, get a glucose. If it reads low, you know what the problem is. You can fix it. If it reads high, you think they're a diabetic and we're in DKA or hyperosmolar, it'll give you a clue as do they have hyperkalemia, issues like that. Anything in between really doesn't matter for the most part. So this is the 12 lead. <clears throat> too fast, too slow, or okayish? I would say it's too fast. So machine says 200. All right, when I start doing my boxes, I'm going to go 300. What? So I'm between 150 and 300. So about two something. So I agree with that. All right, so the rate is too fast. So my next question is, is a narrow Y complex QRS? I'm going to look at my QRS. It looks fairly narrow. My machine agrees. So I have a narrow complex <coughs> tachycardia. <clears throat> the next question is, is it regular or irregular? <clears throat> and looking at this just from uh, across the room, I would say it looks pretty regular, all right? The problem is when you get rates above 180 or 190 and you look at it on paper, they're all going to look regular. There's not enough difference in the space. You can get out some calipers, you can get a sheet of paper and mark it out like we learned in medic school to see if it's regular or not. <clears throat> but in reality, that takes too much time. I got to put my glasses on and sometimes we're working in environments that's pretty dark and not conductive to that or conducive to that. So what I, the way I determine regularity is I look at this and say it's a narrow complex, tachycardia, way too fast. I'm going to put my hand on the patient's pulse, and that's going to give me is this regular or irregular. I'm going to touch the wrist. they got a great radio. You can feel that. If not, I'm going to put a carotid, okay? If nothing else, I break out that stethoscope, wipe the dust off of it, put it on their chest, listen to their heart. And I can tell, is it regular or irregular at this point in the game? <clears throat> so I will tell you that this patient's pulse rate is irregular. So now I have a narrow, complex, tacky, rate of almost 200, it's irregular. What's this rhythm right here? <clears throat> Atrial fibrillation, right. Yeah, this is AFib with RVR. So AFib is irregular. Atrial, I can't even spell atrial this morning. Atrial um, fibrillation um, with a rapid ventricular spate response. That's what the RVR stands for, RVR. So AFib is probably one of the more common uh, dysrhythmias you're going to see. A lot of folks have it. Most folks uh, aren't in RVR all the time. They're just in AFib. The treatment methodology for these folks long term is we keep the rate down and we anticoagulate them to keep them from getting blood clots. Because you think about if you're in AFib, that atria is just quivering and it's a uh, big risk for getting blood clots. <clears throat> so go back to my pragmatic 12 leads. This is too fast. Is it wide or narrow? We said it is narrow. So is it regular or irregular? We said it's irregular. So the odds are this is AFib with RVR, okay? So rates, you consider tachycardic. So technically by American Heart, anything over 100 is tachycardia. If you look at some of the sepsis guidelines we're using in the hospital, if somebody has a heart rate greater than 90, we call them tachycardic and they meet some sepsis criteria. So a lot of variability there. In reality, the numbers I think about is 50 to 150. So rates less than 50, are going to usually be cardiac in nature, okay? Rates greater than or equal to 150 are usually cardiac in nature as well. The body doesn't use the amount of response greater than 150 for just hypotension, dehydration, things like that. 
So you think cardiac in nature. So those are the numbers I think about. <clears throat> when you think about heart rate, though, remember that some people, or all people really, cardiac output is heart rate times stroke volume. So you have some people who have sick hearts, don't get good squeeze, low cardiac output at baseline, or low stroke volume, and they have a resting heart rate that's higher at baseline than normal to keep cardiac output. So remember your PEDS training, we talked about PEDS heart rates always a little bit faster. Same thing with people with sick hearts. They cannot adjust stroke volume. They address cardiac output by heart rate, okay? <clears throat> Won't go into some of this. So this is that same EKG we talked about. So AFib causes two problems. You get decreased cardiac output and thrombus formation. So when you think about uh, AFib, normal physiology, you get SA node, symmetric distribution of impulse, AV node, so atria contracts, then ventricles contract, right? With AFib, what happened is, the way I interpret this is, most folks with AFib have had some kind of strain on the heart. It's pretty common with folks with pulmonary disease, COPD, because you get increased pressures in the lungs, Therefore, it makes the ventricles and the atria stretch out. When that stretches out, it kind of jacks up the electrical system or wiring of the atria. <clears throat> the good news is that every cell in the heart can conduct electricity, all right? The bad news is when these cells or the wiring gets jacked up, they all want to fire at different times. So now you have somebody who has an enlarged atria, all right? The SA node fires since the impulse, but because some of these conductions are not kept anymore, other parts of the heart cells fire, so you get irregular contraction of the atria. And what that does, it decreases the amount of blood supply that gets into this ventricle, all right, which decreases the amount of blood that goes to the lungs or goes to the body, so you get lower cardiac output. This is called the atrial kick. Now, I heard voices. So most young folks can manage uh, cardiac output with a healthy heart without having the atrial kick. The older we get, is we get more sclerosed arteries, calcium in our arteries, we get hypertension, other health problems. We really need this atrial kick to help fill our ventricles to get our cardiac output. Causes of AFib, there's some acute problems. So people who are acutely hyperthyroid or have an overdose of thyroid medicines will get into AFib because the heart's just so excited. Alcohol, which is really a depressant, but alcohol also jacks up cardiac cells and you get acute AFib with that. Most of the folks that go into, with alcohol or thyroid issues, go into AFib and go into RVR pretty quick. Sympathematic, so folks smoking some crack, folks doing some meth, uh, can go into AFib just like VFib. COPD, we talked about long-term. If I have a person who's never had AFib and now they're acutely dysmic, hypoxic, and they're in tachycardic, AFib, RVR, a flutter, or even a SVT, I think PE, all right? Because you think about the heart, and you got the lungs back this way, you get a blood clot here. Now the pressure in the chest cavity goes up greatly, so you get a rapid expansion, dilatation of the atrium and ventricles, and it jacks up that conduction system. <clears throat> Electrolytes, magnesium, calcium, and then obviously heart failure, cardiomyopathy, because it stretches the cardiac tissue, all right? <clears throat> we talked about decreased cardiac output. These folks will sometimes pass out because of their AFib. Maybe they have AFib <clears throat> and then uh, they're rate controlled and for some reason they don't take their medicine. Now they go from a heart rate of 90 to a heart rate of 160 and they syncopize because of a rapid blood pressure drop at that point. Thrombus formation is the other problem. You can get strokes, you can get small strokes or TIAs. And then you can get strokes or blood clots that go to the gut and get mes mesenteric ischemia. You can get DVTs, things like that. Acute management, you got to determine is the rate the problem or the response. Remember, AFib is fairly common. Folks who have AFib and get sick will go into AFib with RVR. Just like if I don't have AFib, but I go out and run a mile, my heart rate's going to go up. Okay, I'm going to get in sinus tack. Somebody who has AFib goes out and runs a mile. They can go into AFib with RVR because their underlying rhythm is AFib. So you got to figure out is the rate the problem or is the rate the response, okay? <clears throat> Just like we learned in ACLS. The way we manage this, uh, we used to talk about symptom onset. 
So folks who have AFib less than 48 hours, we can think about electrocardioversion and getting them out of AFib. That's probably the better option. But the risk is if they're in AFib and we synchronize cardiovert them and they go from AFib to a normal sinus rhythm, they may have blood clots turning up in that atria that we're now going to push out and they can have an acute stroke or a big PE or an issue like that. So 48 hours used to be the, I love this video, it used to be the uh, numbers, but now it's pretty confusing. So now we got data that says it really doesn't matter. Um, uh, the onset, we're better off in the ER and the pre-hospital world uh, treating these folks by doing rate control because you got some folks who go into acute AFib, get a clot pretty early on, we don't know it. We also have a large uh, population of people who have AFib and they don't feel it until their heart rate gets really fast. So the risk of throwing a clot is pretty high. So we do rate control. We slow the rate down, then get an echocardiogram on them <clears throat> and decide if we're going to cardiovert them. <clears throat> the other thing they do is um, a lot of times we'll go in almost like you're doing a, a cath or a heart attack. We put a wire in the groin, go up, look for the area that's been messed up and they ablate it and burn it. And hopefully the results with that would be normal conduction SA node through AV node. The other thing we do is we sometimes go in there and burn out the entire electrical system and put a pacemaker in instead, and that keeps them out of AFib. All right. <clears throat> so things we can do in the field. Cartazem was approved last year or the year before as category B. Cartazem is a calcium channel blocker, and we use it quite frequently in the hospital for AFib with RVR. Things you got to think about, though, is um, again, is the rate the problem or the response? So if you have a 70-year-old with a UTI, the heart rate of 160, blood pressure of 90, who has a fever, and we give them diltiazem and slow the heart rate down, what's going to happen to the blood pressure? Cardiac output's going to drop. They can become more hypotensive. We just made them worse. Remember, their tachycardia is probably a response to their infection and dehydration. So you got to be very cautious when you think about using diltiazem because of that. Most of the time in the ER, I'm going to look at the patient. They can get a fluid bolus. I'm assessing dehydration, treating for it. All right. If that doesn't get better, then I consider using cardizium. All right. <clears throat> now, these are all for stable-ish people we're talking about. Obviously, the patient with a heart rate of 160, blood pressure of 80 that is altered, they're unstable. You would never give them DILT because obviously you're going to drop the blood pressure. The good news with diltiazem, it is a calcium channel blocker. So if I were a chance to give somebody too much diltiazem and now I drop their blood pressure, they become hypotensive, what drug can I give them to correct my diltiazem? Calcium, right, Chief? Yeah, you give them calcium, right? And that fixes the problem. So we do have kind of a reversal for it. Um, <clears throat> but that is the risk of diltiazem. That's probably why it's category B. The other problem with DILT in the pre-hospital world is that it has to be refrigerated. There are other drugs that we use for uh, AFib uh, or tachycardias. they are beta blockers such as metoprolol, um, low pressor sometimes, esmolol. Uh, the problem with that is rapid onset. The other problem with that is that theoretically folks that do coke uh, that you give a beta blocker to and tachycardic, if you block the beta receptors only, you're lower the heart rate, but the blood pressure goes sky high. Um, and those things are kind of hard to reverse. So currently in Alabama, we're not having any beta blockers in the field. We do have this though. Unstable AFib is pretty scary. And the problem is now you have somebody with a uh, AFib, RVR, low blood pressure. All the medicines we give to slow the heart rate down, lower blood pressure, all right? <clears throat> the other problem is if we cardiovert them, there's a risk of them throwing a clot and having a big stroke. The other problem is, remember, cardiac output, that is a scary clown, cardiac output equals heart rate times stroke volume. So if I have somebody that has a sick heart, and now they have AFib, and their heart rate's in the 160s, and their stroke volume is low because their heart's jacked up from underlying heart disease, and their blood pressure's already low, and I carry over them out of AFib, now their heart rate is 90, their blood pressure can crash on us pretty quick because I needed that heart rate to increase the cardiac output. So folks that you're gonna cardiovert out of AFib, you need to have some dobutamine, all right, or some kind of inotrope. If you're uh, a critical care truck, you can use milrinone, something like that is fine, but you wanna have that out and available. So if you cardiovert them, 
they get a, out get out of their AFib RVR, drop their rate, and now their blood pressure is dirt. You're going to have to increase cardiac output somehow, increase that stroke volume. So what you need at that point is some dobutamine or some mil milnarone. Okay, so these folks are pretty scary to manage. Let's see what our time's looking like. Any questions from the internet land? Good. That's either good or bad. I'm not sure which. All right. So this is a 60-ish uh, year old person, heart rate of 140s, blood pressure is stable, respirations 22-ish, SATs are 95, D-stick is okay. And this is our 12 lead here. Too fast, too slow, or okay-ish. Excuse me. I would say that the rate is okay-ish. Uh, it's a too fast, so we got 300, 150, so around 140 to 150, so we're right there on the verge. So you could call it too fast or you could call it okay-ish. Either way, I guess you need to look at the patient and say stable, unstable clinically. Uh, so this rate's right there on the cuff, all right? I would say that the QRS looks reasonable. I'm looking for injury patterns. I got some ST depression here. Is it a strain pattern? Is it ischemia? Don't know yet. I got 2-3 in AVF. That looks funky, but it's not a STEMI. V1 through V4. Again, it looks abnormal. We got some extra clicks there, but it doesn't look to be a STEMI. And I look at AVR. Now I'm going to go back and look at my PR interval. I usually look at lead two for that. It's really hard to tell if that's a T or a P. QRS looks reasonable. QT-ish. Looks okay. And I look one more time for injury patterns. So what is this? I got a narrow complex tachycardia-ish. Pretty regular. I got extra beats. Something looks funky through here. I put my hand on the patient's pulse and it's regular. It's not irregular. What is this? So this would be a flutter. So a flutter usually is a two to one conduction and the rates you normally see is between 140 in the low 150s, 150-ish, all right, and it's pretty regular. Sinus tack would probably be variable, so you look on the monitor, it's going to say 144, 136, 149, 132. When you feel it's regular, but it's not going to have a regular pattern here, all right. The other way you can determine this is, is by history, if they have underlying heart disease, or two, Give them a little fluid and see if the rate slows down. And if it does, it's probably sinus tack, right? But this is a flutter with RVR. Here's another one. Rate is 143, 300, 150. Yeah, I'll say that's probably about 140-ish, 150. I look injury patterns. I got some sloping here in fairly one, two. That looks fine. Maybe a strain pattern. Two, three in AVF, the sloping. V1 through V4 looks reasonable. AVR, yeah, maybe one millimeter elevation, but nothing that makes me super uncomfortable. Then I go back and look at my intervals. My QRS looks good. Really don't see a P wave unless that's it, or a T wave, so not sure. So again, this is a flutter. If you come down and look at your rhythm strip, it has that classic, excuse me, sawtooth pattern, all right? and it fits that rate category of the 140s to the low 150s, it's regular, okay? Most of the folks in A flutter are gonna be fairly stable. That's like a precursor to AFib. The heart is probably healthier than folks with AFib. Some are not, some cannot tolerate it though. Um, always look for the secondary cause, sepsis, dehydration, fever, some underlying injury that makes them tachycardic. I'm gonna treat with IV fluids. This person could also get a little bit of dilt, okay? But a flutter is basically a re-entry pattern, tachycardia. You get an SA node firing. It loops back through an accessory channel and fires again. And you get a two to one is more common, sometimes three to one, sometimes four to one. Here's somebody that's, the rate is fine. So this person is actually beta blocked at baseline. They own a chronic beta blocker and that slows the ventricular rate down but you can see it does nothing for the atrial rate, okay? So this patient complains of shortness of breath, blood pressure is stable, heart rate's in the 50s, uh, SATs are fine. This person does not need any kind of aggressive 
medication for this dysrhythmia because their ventricular rate, which controls cardiac output, is okay. Do they need to be evaluated at the hospital? Yes, we need to figure out why they're still in a flutter, okay? This person probably needs an ablation and a pacemaker. These folks are at risk for going to AFib, or excuse me, a flooded with RVR or a fib with RVR. They're also high risk for throwing blood clots. So we need to correct this, but there's nothing that you can do in the field, nothing I'm gonna do in the ER to manage that. This is a young chick with palpitations, vital signs, blood pressure is fine, stats are fine, D stick is good. She does a little Red Bull. I'm more of a monster guy, but it is what it is. Too fast, too slow, or okay. I would say the ventricular rate is too fast. Next question, is it narrow Y complex QRS? I say it's a narrow complex. Is it regular or irregular? Looks regular on the monitor. I'm gonna touch the patient and feel. Feels pretty regular. So I got a young chick doing Red Bull, narrow complex tacky in the 170s. What is this? This is SVT, right? Right, so we got options to treat this. We can do vagal maneuvers as we're putting her on the uh, 12 lead, <clears throat> getting the IV access started, have them bear down, have them blow on their thumb. Sometimes I give them a syringe <clears throat> and loosen it and have them blow on the syringe, try to blow the plunger out. They can't do it, but that makes them vagal down. I don't do carotid massages anymore uh, for kids. <clears throat> I don't do the shake them by their feet, put ice packs on them. Parents usually get aggressive and attack you when you do that. Um, I've seen for peds population, I've seen more ER techs fix pediatric SVT than I've done with medicine. And that's because they get a rectal thermometer and check the kid's temperature to see if they got a fever. And that's a vagal maneuver. Um, I would not recommend you guys doing that, especially in adults, but that would vagal you out. So, you know what I mean? Thanks. Yes, yes. I thought it was COVID protocol. No, sir. No, sir. There's no <laughs> protocol. So treatment, vagal while getting ready, IV access, and then obviously a denison or a dental card. State protocol is six MIGs. You can repeat that at 12 MIGs. Um, I think, unfortunately, it's still category B. Uh, that should change soon. Um, a denison has a very low uh, uh, short half-life. There is low risk uh, for this medication, uh, good benefit. So what happens is with SVT, you basically got a loop circuit like an A flutter. When you give a denison, it blocks this AV node and it resets this, all right, so that normal conduction can ensue. For those of y'all have given it, you've seen it, you give a denison, you get this bradycardic or asystolic rhythm for a few minutes, everybody freaks out, but then the heart restarts. Um, some places I've worked, they put people on the pads, do all that stuff. In reality, uh, it's fairly safe. You don't have to do that, uh, save you a little bit of money as well. Cool thing is, if I had somebody that was an AFib, RVR, or a flutter, RVR, and it was a narrow complex, right? And I think it's SVT, and I give them a denison, nothing bad's going to happen. I'm going to look on the monitor, and you're going to see the AFib or the A flutter, and eventually the QRS will come back, and they go back into a AFib, A flutter with a uh, non-rapid response. So adenosine is fairly safe for all narrow complex tachycardias. I don't personally like giving it for uh, Y complex tachys. American Heart says you can. <clears throat> In theory, if I had somebody that had AFib, that got firing all through here, <clears throat> and they have an accessory pathway through something besides the AV node, and that's why they have a Y complex QRS, and I give adenosine and I block this, in theory, this a fib could go through this pathway and cause a V fib. And it's poor form to take your patient from a perfusing rhythm to a non perfusing rhythm. That's all theoretical. Um, so, I'm, again, American Heart says you can do it. I've seen other colleagues do it and they've had success. Uh, I still prefer not to give adenosine to Y complex tachys, narrow, yeah, Y complex tachys. This is one, a copy of an EKG that they brought to me when I was working down south. Um, I said, Doc, can you sign this EKG? Most hospitals, you got to sign EKGs within 10 minutes. I thought they were joking. I'm like, ha ha, very funny. And they said, no, he's in triage. And so that was good. The patient was still in triage. So he knew he was alive. Uh, but this is a concerning EKG, right? So I shouldn't have to ask you, is it too fast, too slow, or okay-ish? 
because it's not okay by any means. The first question you should ask yourself is, is dude alive? Uh, this patient was alive. So what is this? This is VTAC, obviously with a pulse because they're alive, right? So rate really doesn't matter. We know it's 300 greater than 200, okay? Um, <clears throat> so wide or narrow, it is wide. So this is VTAC until proven otherwise. We've got several therapeutic options. Um, well, we already talked about stability is relative, okay? Are they awake? Do they have a pulse? I would bet you my entire allotment of cash in my wallet, all $7, if you ask them if they have chest pain, trouble breathing, are they weak or dizzy, they're going to say yes. So they meet unstable guidelines by American Heart. I would say if they have a pulse, they are stable-ish. If they don't, they're unstable. Um, <clears throat> most of these folks are self-sedated. They're confused. If they're not confused, I would sedate them before doing cardioversion on those guys. But all kind of tables you can look at to determine if it's a VTAC or is it AFib with aberrancy. Does not matter at 2 in the morning in the ER. Does not matter at noon in the pre-hospital world. Why complex tachy can be VTAC, can kill people. So we treat it like that until proven otherwise. So MEO is a good drug to give. It's 150 milligrams over 10 minutes. Remember this, uh, bubbles is a fancy medical term for that. But when you draw it up, draw it up slow, put it in your bag or put it in your syringe. You don't want to give the bubble, so it takes a few minutes to get that ready. <clears throat> MEO was a drug of choice in the 90s and early 2000s. It's kind of going by the wayside. It has pretty significant half-life. It has issues with pulmonary problems long-term orally, so we don't like to use it for people at home. But it is a relatively safe drug for any kind of tachydysrhythmia. The price has gone down, too. I'm still liking lidocaine, 1.5 mg per kilo. Uh, give them a bolus of that, and then do a 1 to 4 milligram per minute drip on these people. Obviously, the best thing to do for these folks is electricity or ride the lightning, as they say. So you're going to synchronize to revert these people. All right. That means the candles have to be on. The machine has to be on sync. If the patient is talking to you, awake and alert, they need sedation. So you call med control for a little bit of Versed. All right. Maybe a little bit of ketamine. All right, you have airway stuff available in case they go from VTAC to VFib and you need to work them as a cardiac arrest. If they're altered, if the blood pressure is dirt, they're ashen, they're confused, they don't get sedation. They still get synchronized, right? So they still get the sink turned on, you charge to 100, and you synchronize cardiovert. If you get a response, they go into a sinus rhythm, life is good, you reassess vitals. If they're not bradycardic, consider a lot of cane infusion. You don't have to. If they're bradycardic, no lidocaine, no amnio. And that's the big side effect with people who get amnio. You give amnio first, then you synchronize cardiovert, you're going to see bradycardia a lot of times because amnio is going to block them down. Okay. Um, <clears throat> if they don't come out of this, I would sedate again and synchronize cardiovert and just go up to 360 and get it done. If they go into VFib after this, charge the 360 and pop them. Don't do CPR, don't do anything else. Defibrillate and then start your CPR. Most folks in VTAC, you can fix with electricity and they go into a perfusing rhythm. Here we go with that confusion. VTAC resuscitation, they were in VFib, they came back, they came back into a VTAC. But yep. There was some debate whether it was a SVT with a aberrant, aberrant C. And we were like, what do you pulse? Hell, they're going to the hospital. Right, exactly. Yeah, yeah. And so think about it. Somebody with that this rhythm, they got underlying heart problems, right? Yeah. So if you if you synchronize cardiovertum and you're getting them back, they may have AFib with aberrancy or SVT with aberrancy, and they can have a fast, complex, wide uh, tachycardia. So you go back to that. If they're unstable, <clears throat> synchronize cardiovertum again. If they're not, get to the hospital so we can do a little more digging to find out what's going on. Because the people who have bad heart disease and tachydysrhythmias, especially AFib A flood, are sometimes are really tough to manage if they're hypotensive. Some of these patients too will have an external, I mean, an internal. Yep, they sure will. And those things are fine. Don't put your pads over that. <clears throat> um, uh, but if they got an internal and it's firing, let it work. You know what I mean? Not a problem. Let's see. All right. <laughs> so this is a diabetic, chest pain, uh, diaphoresis. Vital signs are reasonable. 
Glucose is 155. That's not bad for a diabetic in the deep south. <clears throat> this is her EKG. We got an EKG because she's a diabetic with chest pain. And even if she had, had nausea, vomiting, and shortness of breath, those are ACS symptoms. So we get a 12 lead. Rate, too fast, too slow, or okay-ish. I'll say the rate is okay. 300, 150, 175, I'm getting bored. All right, so rate's okay. I'm going to look injury patterns. One, AVL, lateral, a little bit here, a little concerning, but not super scary, and nothing else anywhere else. Two, three, and AVF. I got this is concerning for ischemia. It's not a STEMI, but it's concerning. Could be old, could be new. V1 through V4 looks okay. AVR is reasonable. All right. So diabetic chick, chest pain, nausea, vomiting. We're going to go through our mnemonics. I still like saying Mona, even though Mona's gone out of favor. We're going to give aspirin first. <clears throat> the only reason I would not give aspirin to a chick with chest pain and abnormal MKG would be if she's allergic to it. If she says she's on blood thinners, has a GI bleed, doesn't want to take it at this point, I'm like, that's fine. You can refuse. I recommend it, but that's fine. I would think maybe some nitro decreases preload, increases perfusion. Oxygen, her sats were fine. If she says she's short of breath and she's breathing fast, a little bit of O2 is fine. But if not, doesn't really need oxygen at this point. Morphine, vasodilator, lowers blood pressure. Uh, makes you go from having chest pain to I'm high now and I have chest pain, but it's reasonable to do. All right. Care. What? I have chest pain, but I don't care. That's right. I don't care. All right. So um, we've done her vitals. We've got our history. Remember, important questions to ask for diabetes is you take shots or pills because if they say shots, we assume it's insulin that we know then they have more serious disease, more prone to complications. All right. Appropriate other medications. Are you on blood pressure medicines? Do you have a heart attack? Have you had heart attacks in the past? We talked about Mona. I'm not a big fan of Fona, fentanyl. You can do it. It uh, doesn't lower blood pressure. doesn't really make a big difference. There are some studies that the fentanyl is better to use on people that go into the cath lab because it doesn't jack up the blood thinners we give in the cath lab. She's not going to the cath lab at this point, uh, so morphine is probably more reasonable. There's no reason to give her ketamine for this whatsoever. Big risk of making her altered, not being able to get a history, doing issues with that, not going to do anything, may actually increase heart rate and blood pressure, which we really don't want to do. So <clears throat> if you've been to my these class before, you've seen the picture of this. Chick's first EKG was normal, so what do we do? We do repeat EKGs, right? If first EKG is a STEMI, we're done. We don't need any more EKGs. If the first EKG is normal and the patient has a scary history or exam, then we repeat EKGs, right? We've already talked about aspirin. Aspirin blots the platelets so that the platelets cannot attach to each other so this clot doesn't get bigger. We talked about how <clears throat> morphine causes dilation of the vessel, as does nitro. So this is Chick's second EKG. It was done a few minutes later. Rate still okay-ish. Injury patterns still have that. A little bit concerning, but it's just in one lead, so I can't call it a STEMI. Not Significant change, that's very concerning though. V1 through V4 looks reasonable, AVR looks fine. So maybe now I give her more morphine, I'm getting a better history. I'm gonna start going through um, maybe uh, appropriate history for lytics if she ever does have a STEMI. Any major surgeries, are you on blood thinners, ever had a hemorrhagic stroke, brain aneurysm, things like that that make a big difference for lytic use. And then every three to five minutes, I'm gonna get another EKG. And this is her EKG, the third one. So I'm looking at leads one, got a little bit there. That's definitely up now. And then lateral, what do we see? Now we got it, right? So we got ST elevation now at this point. So I got one, two, three and a half leads laterally with ST elevation. This is now a lateral STEMI. So now everything changes, right? So now she has definitely, she declared herself. I'm gonna go look at leads two, three and AVF. This is still concerning, right? So this is reciprocal changes. V1 through V4, I'm actually up there, right? And I look at AVR. So you think about anatomy, this is a septal, anterior and lateral. So she's probably got something coming off her left main that's wrapping around the heart, right? Left main, that's the cirque. 
So now she has a STEMI. So now everything changes. So now the fact that she didn't get oxygen earlier, now she gets O2 and it's not supplemental. It's pre-oxygenation before she goes into cardiac arrest because it's just you in the back of the truck. A couple of liters of nasal cannula. <clears throat> now, if she did not take that aspirin earlier, now I say, hey, look, I understand that you're on blood thinner. If you have a GI bleed, your EKG is pretty concerning. We don't say that you're having a heart attack. You're going to die. That's going to make her get more stress, right? Um, but at this point, the only reason she does not get aspirin is if she tells you she's allergic and last time she had aspirin, they had a cut her throat to put a tube in it. All right. Everything else goes out the window. Now she gets an aspirin. Aspirin saves lives. <clears throat> OK, she gets a fluid bolus, consider more nitro. She also gets deep fib pads put on her at this point in the game. Every chest pain does not get deep fib pads. You run broke. But the biggest risk for death is dysrhythmia, VTAC, VFib or bradycardia, <clears throat> heart block. So now she gets deep fib pads. And now we call TCC. She gets put in the system. She goes to appropriate cath app facility. We kind of talked about that. Let's talk about some other 12 leads real quick, and we'll take a break. Too fast, too slow, or OK. I said the ventricular rate is OK. So 300, 150, 90-ish. All right. I'm going to look at injury patterns. I'm going to look at leads 1, AVL, and lateral. T-wave inversion there. All right, a little concerning, not a STEMI. 2, 3, and AVF. We got decreased size or amplitude, so that's a little bit concerning. Could be a big person, all right, but there's no STEMI, all right. V1 through V4, a little bit of elevation there, a couple of millimeters there. That makes me very uncomfortable, as does this, right? So about three to four millimeters. So makes me very uncomfortable. Uh, so this is a STEMI-ish or STEMI by definition, right? I'm going to finish out my, uh, my, the plan. I look at AVR. It's opposite of one and there's no ST elevation. The next thing I do, I look at my intervals. I'm looking for my PR interval. I usually start here. Really don't see much of a P wave, so maybe there's some AFib or something like that going on. My QRS looks fairly wide. QRS is 140, so it's greater than 120. So I got a wide QRS and I start looking for QT. My QT interval looks reasonable. <clears throat> so now I have a person who has ST elevation and the anterior leads, but they have a wide QRS. So now we got to go a little bit deeper. So now we got to say, OK, wide QRS. This is a bundle branch block. The question is, is it a left bundle or a right bundle? All right, so this, if we have a negative deflection of V1 and no Q in AVL, it is a left bundle branch block. So now we have a left bundle branch block and that kind of changes the rules on how we determine STEMI or no STEMI, okay? So, <clears throat> show STEMI. Sometimes the machine would read STEMI because of this as well, but we gotta recognize that this is a Y complex, QRS, left bundle. Now, if you saw this and you had a- QRS has to be wide to be a bundle? Yes, sir, yeah. If it's QRS is not wide, it's not a bundle branch block. You gotta have a wide QRS. Now, if you saw a CKG and you got a patient that's 70 years old in front of you and they're diaphoretic, having chest pain, and you put this in the STEMI system, I'm not going to fuss at you. Nobody's going to fuss at you, right? All right. But for deeper detail, this is a left bundle. So what's going on with the left bundle is obviously we've talked about conduction, SA node, AV node, then it goes down and breaks into the left and right bundle. For some reason, this conduction system has been stretched, usually due to cardiomyopathy, left ventricular involvement. This gets big and swollen. So this wiring or mesh network of fiber stretches out and it slows conduction through. All right. And that can be due to a chronic problem or an acute problem. Left bundles. Lots of ways to define them. I use the QRS direction pointing down in V1 to V2, and I look at the AVL and say if there's no Q, I call it a left bundle. <clears throat> you can think about vectors, and this probably makes everybody roll their eyes. You got to understand vectors, but you don't have to understand them at two o'clock in the morning. So this is something you, you get a grasp of this concept, so you understand the, the rules and the memorization for left and right bundle, all right? And then you relearn this every few months, or at least for me, that's the way I do it. 
Okay. There's no way I can figure this out at two in the morning when I've already worked a 24 hour shift and haven't slept in a couple of days. But technically, the QRS going in the direction of the vector should be positive. So V1 is going away from the left side of the heart. So that QRS will be negative in V1. All right. It's going toward the direction of V6. So left bundles usually have a positive QRS in V6. All right. But what I look at, most important things to remember, QRS greater than 120, you gotta have a wide QRS. There's a Q in V1, all right? Well, that's not the one I'd like. There's no Q in AVL, that's what I use. We've already talked about causes. This is carbosis criteria. This is what we kind of use to look at left bundles to see if they're uh, acute infarct, STEMI, or no STEMI. All right, so concordant ST elevation. So ST elevation in the direction of the QRS is bad in a left bundle or a normal uh, rhythm, okay? <clears throat> concordant ST depression, all right, for a posterior stays the same. This is where it changes. Discord. So if the T wave is opposite the QRS, you need about five millimeters or more before we get concerned about it being a STEMI. So any ST elevation, left bundle or not, should be, that's concordant, is concerning for a STEMI. You know, left bundle or anything else. Any concordant ST depression, like a posterior, T wave, same direction as the QRS, is a STEMI. If there is discordance, QRS one direction, T wave in the other, it's got to be more than five millimeters. And that's the big difference with left bundle. So this is our same EKG. We know it's a left and bundle. Only left bundle yes, bundle. yes, sir. Now we use this for paste rhythms as well because most paste rhythms are ventricular paste. So if I have somebody that's got a pace or spike having chest pain, we used to say you can't interpret paste rhythms. In reality, you can use scarbosis for that, okay? Uh, but this is just left bundles, not right bundles. We'll do right bundles another day. My goal is to do left bundle one time, uh, one class, and the next class we'll do right bundles. And back and forth, we'll do that this year until you guys get comfortable. So this is that same EKG. We know we got ST elevation. We also know that we're a left bundle. We got a wide QRS. There's no Q in AVL and we're pointed down, right? And we talked about V6, we have a positive QRS as well, but that's, doesn't have to be memorized. I think the things that you memorize is the QRS direction and the no Q and AVL, all right? So our elevation is in these leads. So if there was discordance, I mean, excuse me, <coughs> concordance, QRS going down, and T wave going down, that'll be a posterior MI, just like any time, right? But we actually have discord, QRS one direction, T wave in the other. So that's discord, and that's not really more than five millimeters. So this is not a super scary EKG, okay? Now again, until you get used to this stuff and feel comfortable, if you call in TCC and say, hey, I got a STEMI that doesn't read STEMI, I like to put them in the system, it's a, a non-diagnostic EKG or whatever phrase you want to use. We'll get you hooked up to the appropriate hospital. They can look at it. I'd rather you uh, uh, err on the side of overcall and undercall, okay? Uh, in the next couple of years, we should be able to read these pretty tight. But for now, if you saw this and you were concerned, I'm not going to ding you, all right? But this is a left bundle. This is discord. Remember, discord is good. It's like a good marriage. You got to fight a little bit, right? Uh -huh, that's kind of funny. Nobody smiled. Maybe somebody smiled. Uh, so discord is good. Concordance is bad. Here's another one. So we got Y complex QRS. There's no Q. This is pointing down. So this is a left bundle. And then we're going to look for uh, changes. We got one AVL lateral. That's discord, but that's not V1 through V4. So it doesn't matter. 2, 3, and AVF, we have discordance, but no elevation. <clears throat> V1 through V4, a little bit of discord, 
but it's not more than five millimeters. So that's fine. And AVR looks good as well. So that's a lift bundle that looks reassuring. So remember, Discord is good. Discord is good. All right, here's another one. So this one says left bundle. And I know everybody looks at that. Hopefully we can take this off our EKG soon. But rate is okay-ish. I'd say it's 300, 150, 180-ish maybe. All right. Maybe a little bit slower. Um, one AVL looks reasonable. B5 and 6. I have concordant ST elevation. So that's concerning for a STEMI, right? I'm looking over here at 2, 3 and AVF. That looks very concerning. This is Discord, less than five. So that's fine. That's Discord. All right, V1 through V4, a little bit of depression here, but it's just one lead. AVR looks fine, all right? So if I looked at this and didn't know it was a left bundle branch block, I would see these two leads and I would say, hey, I got a STEMI, correct? Now, if I'm going deeper into this and I do all this and I go back and look at my PR interval and my QRS is wide and I say, okay, so QRS is wide. I look over here, it's a left bundle because I'm pointing down, no Q and AVL. I'm going to use Scarbosa, all right? So by Scarbosa, this is okay, but this is concordant ST elevation. So this is still a STEMI. So concordant ST elevation is a STEMI in a left bundle or anything else. Now, if I keep on going through and I look at 2, 3, and AVF, this looks scary as dirt, <clears throat> except it's a left bundle. So for a left bundle, that doesn't scare me. Same thing here. None of this scares me. AVR looks fine. But this is a STEMI any way you play it. A lot of the machines are going to say left bundle, and then they won't diagnose STEMIs or no STEMIs. All right. So again, the way you get better at 12 leads, you look at a lot of them. You got to look at a whole bunch of normal. So you recognize abnormal. Once you recognize abnormal, you say, does it matter? Or does it not matter? <clears throat> so this year we're going a little bit deeper. We're going to look at STEMIs. And we all are looking at left bundles and right bundles. OK, this is a STEMI any way you cut it. All right. This take uh, about seven or so minutes, if that's OK. Yeah, let's take about five or ten minutes. Yeah, let's do five minutes. And then we'll come back and talk about some GYN emergencies and uh, we'll hit left bundles again next time. So five minutes, guys. OK, just a reminder, the uh, password for today is OB and the chat feature is not working. So send any questions on an email to Alabama AMS challenge at gmail.com. See you in about seven minutes. All right, guys, we'll get going again. We're going to talk about uh, GYN. And then hopefully at the end, we have a few minutes to uh, talk about a, a few more issues related to COVID. But so uh, menarche is uh, between ages 12 and 13. Menopause is 45 to 52. That being said, the uh, youngest person that I've seen deliver a baby is nine. OK, uh, the last delivery I actually did myself was an 11 year old that delivered a baby. Uh, and then I've seen the oldest I've seen is 54. We had a hypertensive patient a couple of years ago. There was hypertensive emergency, <clears throat> yada, yada. Short version was she was not hypertensive emergency. She was preeclamptic and 54. So the point of that is um, in the ER, if I have someone between the ages of nine and 60 with belly pain, I get a pregnancy test. All right. Uh, don't get burned by this. You don't want to be the guy that misses someone who is pregnant. Um, when you think about um, ovulation, every month females <coughs> produce an egg. That egg is shed from the ovary and travels down the fallopian tube. <coughs> if the women are blessed, the remainder of that egg that is left, the shell, so to speak, in the ovary dissolves. If they're unblessed, that shell or remainder of that uh, egg that was uh, secreted um, fills with blood, 
gets big, hard, swollen. These things pop. And then when you get blood into the peritoneal cavity, they have a lot of pain. So it can be a pretty painful process. Other folks also will have these that uh, fill up blood and then the blood finally reabsorbs and they're left with a cyst or some other issue and uh, can cause pain as well. But you think about that's the basic process, the way this works every month an egg is released. If it's fertilized, you get pregnant. If not, the body responds with hormone changes, which we're not going to go into. The lining of the uterus sheds and they get menstruation. All right. So, pregnancy is the big thing we're talking about. Three trimesters, about 40 weeks. The uh, diagnosed from the first day of the last normal menstrual period. Okay. And it's till the uh, baby is delivered. Last about 40 weeks. We've got three trimesters. So there are a lot of apps you can use to calculate dates. We used to have to carry an OB will, uh, which was a cardboard thing that you kind of rolled around. You lined up menstrual dates with due dates and very complicated. Now what I recommend, if you want to figure out dates on somebody, Google MD calc, MD calc, OB, and it would take you to it and you can figure out dates for your patient pretty quick in a matter of minutes. Most people that are pregnant can figure this out as well. So most folks know how far along they are. Uh, this is the routine method of calculating uh, due dates, date of conception, et cetera, until the patient gets an ultrasound. And at that point, we use the ultrasound because we can actually map how big the baby is at that point, and those dates are more efficient. First trimester is the first three months. Fetus is the most vulnerable to medications. Uh, the other problem with this is that this is also the time that a lot of folks don't know they're pregnant. So drug use, tobacco use, medications, vitamins, other injuries, things like other uh, medications or injuries um, is when the fetus is most vulnerable at this point. OK, we get some normal signs. There's no menstrual period. However, in a small portion of once they get pregnant, they get what we call post implant bleeding. So they think they just had a very small cycle. So their, their dates may be off a month because of that. But you get some uh, increased uh, changes in body. We'll talk about in a few minutes. One thing I do want to mention is about a 30% abortion rate. And by abortion rate, I mean a miscarriage. And this is based upon the women that we ask. So <clears throat> if we're questioning, doing data on women about the rate of miscarriage, and we get a 30% rate of the people we ask, What's the actual rate in the general population? I would say it's probably closer to 50 to 60 percent. So I say that is that miscarriages are common. We don't know what caused those uh, for the most part, uh, and we can't explain that. So it is a very common occurrence. It doesn't mean the mom did something wrong. Uh, it was some kind of bad event. It's just we can't explain that. OK, and that's what I try to tell a lot of folks who have a miscarriage is we don't understand all this. All right. Uh, but it's a pretty common occurrence. <clears throat> Class of drugs, this is the way I learned it a long time ago. It was the ABCD uh, theory. That's kind of gone by the wayside now. Now they're kind of looking and saying probably safe to use in pregnancy, not safe, and then unknown. But I still think of drugs this way. Class A shows uh, no risk. A is like grades in school. A means it's okay. The only A drug that I can think of is Reglan. So Reglan is a great drug for nausea and vomiting. There are human trials that show it's safe. Not many other drugs have human trials with pregnant women. Uh, uh, B is uh, animal studies show it's safe to use. Our human studies are inconclusive. Again, not, not a lot of drugs in that category. Category C is probably OK, risk versus benefit, but these are most of the drugs. So if you think about the drugs, Zofran, Finergan, these are all drugs we've used in pregnancy for a long time. Benadryl, these are all class C. That means we really don't have any human studies, but we've been using these drugs for years and we don't see any big risk to this. And then D, I think D is a duh. D is stay away from that medication. There's some meds we cannot give pregnancy because we know it's bad and they're not any of the drugs that we carry I uh, can't think of any drugs that we carry are category D <clears throat> just some drugs to think about adenosine or adenocard if you have a chick 
who's pregnant and has SVT and needs a denison. A denison is safe. Oh, okay. Well, that's my phone going off for a second. So benzos, we used to say they were category B, but in reality, risk to benefit for anxiety, yes. Don't use in pregnancy. If I got somebody that's seizing this pregnant, I'm probably going to be thinking about some benzos in addition to treating for eclampsia. All right. Morphine is reasonable if they need it. The only contraindication to morphine or any kind of opiate in pregnancy is right before delivery. These medicines cross over the uh, placenta barrier. And if you give mom a whole bunch of morphine, baby's going to get it and the baby's born. And now baby's going to be unresponsive because they got too much opiates. And that means you have to bag that kid and you don't want to do that. Narcan is reasonable. Haldol, stay away from if you can, but if mom has schizophrenia and doesn't take her at Haldol and gets suicidal or psychotic and jumps off her bridge, there's a risk to the baby because of that. So we do use Haldol in those folks as well. And then Zofran, nitro, most people who get pregnant uh, do not have underlying heart disease for the most part. So you won't use a lot of nitro, but if someone needs it for CHF, flash pulmonary edema, it's reasonable to give that. Second trimester, trimester is the next three months. Ketamine? <clears throat> so ketamine you can use, but I would, again, I would probably avoid it. I would not give it for pain. Um, if they have excited delirium and they're fighting you, okay, you don't have much choice for that. I think you kind of hosed at that point. There's more risk of them getting injured, going into uh, cardiac arrest from excited delirium, or getting beat up by law enforcement or fire. Not beat up, that sounded bad, but you know what I mean? By physical restraint, there's more of a danger for that. The other thing you think about is second trimester is viability. So years ago, 30 weeks was the magic number. You had to make it to 30 weeks to be delivered and survive. And then it went to 28. Now it's 24 weeks. So that's in this time period. Uh, that's little bitty baby. Uh, but age of viability is doing that second trimester as well. <clears throat> Third trimester, uterus reaches the fundus. Okay. The belly is now called gravid. So changes you get during pregnancy, so volume changes. So the body recognizes that, hey, I'm pregnant. I got to get ready for delivery when I know I'm going to lose blood. So what happens is the body <clears throat> produces more red blood cells. So it increases your blood volume in that way. You also increase plasma, which is the fluid portion of the blood and the clotting factors. Now, because of all this, you increase plasma more than red blood cells. People who are pregnant get a relative anemia by blood test. But in reality, they have more red blood cells, more plasma. And that's getting ready to lose, you know, half a liter to a liter of volume at delivery. <clears throat> Urinary issues. So you think about where the uterus sits. Do I have a slide? Yeah, so the uterus sits just above the bladder. So is this, is the... Uh, Uterus grows, it pushes up and pushes down. <clears throat> so you get urinary retention. So these folks are prone to having uh, problems uh, voiding. They're also prone to urinary tract infections. So that's an issue for pregnancy as well. Constipation, obviously, because you're pushing up on the colons. Big ones for us are organ shifts. So as the uterus grows and the baby goes up, the appendix, which normally hangs out way down here, may get pushed up here. One of the more common surgeries during pregnancy that is not found in the first visit is acute appendicitis because they have pain in the upper quadrant, not the lower. So that's tough. Other things we get is we get cholecystitis. You think about uh, backwash, backflow of bile, you get inflammation of the gallbladder. Venous return, I know we all learned this in paramedic school. <clears throat> the baby is laying on top of the vena cava. You think about the aorta, it's coming down this way bringing blood supply to the body. The vena cava is running back up here, bringing blood back. These have muscles, so it squirts the blood down, it forces it down. This is a passive return system. So if this baby is pressing against this, you get no blood return, all right? That's why we don't lay these pregnant folks flat on their back. Tidal volume is the baby pushes up, it pushes the organs up, which pushes up the diaphragm, which is a flat muscle, which we can see in the cadaver lab we do next time. Um, in short, makes it harder for them to breathe. So they increase their respiratory rate because they can't expand the lungs as much as normal because of the upward shift, all right? You think about blunt trauma, any kind of injury to these patients, 
the thing that's going to get hit first is that big swollen uterus, right, in the baby. Trauma, you think about injury to the baby because that's enlarged. <clears throat> so you think about anatomy for the uterus. So you have the uterine wall, the placenta, which is basically a big vessel that's attached uh, to the uterine wall that delivers blood to the baby. All right. You have fluid. That fluid kind of protects the kid. All right. And keep it pretty moist. The cervix is the opening to the uterus where the baby will eventually come out. First trimester issues, bleeding and abdominal pain. The thing you want to think about is a topic pregnancy. That's the thing that kills people. Remember, age of viability. If they're not going to make it to 20 weeks, the baby, if the baby is born before 20 weeks, the baby is not viable. Okay? Not a lot of things we can do for that. So the biggest problem in the first trimester, our biggest risk is protect the mom, right? Keep mom healthy. Maybe baby can stay and do okay. But a topic pregnancy thing. So again, I think between ages nine and 60, always think belly pain in a woman of childbearing age, belly pain with unstable vitals is a topic pregnancy until proven otherwise. What happens with an atopic pregnancy is this egg is released like we talked about. It's traveling down this fallopian tube, but for some reason it gets stuck in here. All right. So the sperm comes up, fertilizes the egg, the egg attaches inside this fallopian tube, and then as it grows, it ruptures and bleeds. And there's some pretty big vessels that run along this fallopian tube, so big risk for uh, uh, hemorrhagic shock with those folks. <clears throat> risk factors for a topic pregnancy would be STDs, so infections that affect the, uh, the uh, vagin uh, vagina, go into the uterus, get up in those fallopian tubes, uh, will cause scarring or strictures in that fallopian tube and make it hard for the egg to get out. So big risk for atopic pregnancies. <clears throat> Somebody who's had a tubal ligation <clears throat> is also big risk for having a uh, atopic pregnancy. So you think what we do for a tubal ligation, so somebody's had a couple of kids, they decided we're not going to have any more. <clears throat> what they do is they go in for surgery and we put a staple through that fallopian tube or a stitch. And the thought process behind that is that prevents that egg from going all the way down and getting implanted and being pregnant. It also prevents sperm from going up and uh, fertilizing the egg. <clears throat> the problem is that stopping the egg is easy, but stopping the sperm is not. So if you have a BTL, occasionally you can still get a implanted fertilized egg in that fallopian tube. So if someone's had a bilateral, bilateral tubal ligation, their tube's been tied and they're pregnant, <clears throat> they have an ectopic pregnancy until proven otherwise, until you get an ultrasound to prove it, or they go to the OR and you look to make sure they don't have an ectopic pregnancy. Those guys are high risk and people can die from that. Cur sign, if y'all remember that, cur sign. So if you get blood under the diaphragm, so that's the heart, this is the diaphragm, these are the lungs, <clears throat> and you get ectopic pregnancy, it ruptures, you get blood in the belly, that blood touches this diaphragm, you get referred pain to that shoulder. So someone who has belly distension, belly pain, their shoulder is killing them, but you look, there's no signs of trauma, that's called cur sign, or I call it duh sign, that means there's blood in the belly. <clears throat> We talked about the uh, spontaneous abortion and miscarriage. Let's talk about high risk. This is about eclampsia and preeclampsia. So pregnancy induced hypertension or preeclampsia is kind of elevated blood pressures, protein in the urine, vision changes. So in short, the body has a response to the pregnancy. It's almost like a toxin that causes elevated blood pressures, kidney problems, um, blood pressures, when they start getting elevated, is a problem in pregnancy as well because it can damage the placenta. All right, so we treat these pretty aggressively. Preeclampsia is a spectrum that happens during pregnancy, usually it's in the first 20 weeks, <clears throat> up to 30 weeks. It's usually first pregnancy for that patient, we have problems. You get vision changes, we manage this pretty good. 
Um, the problem with this, again, is a lot of times these babies want to need to be delivered early because of placental damage due to hypertension. OK, you can also get eclampsia up to six weeks postpartum. By that, I mean mama does fairly well throughout delivery, delivers baby and then gets super high blood pressure, protein, the urine, vision problems, headaches, doesn't feel well. Uh, and you can have that. And again, it's just due to the baby. All right. Uh, usually it's in the first week, about 90 percent of the time but there's some case reports of up to six weeks of having this postpartum. Now, there's a difference between preeclampsia and eclampsia. Eclampsia is when they start seizing. All right, and that's very concerning. Uh, it's a stress to the, uh, uh, the central nervous system, used due to the hypertension and the toxins, all right? So we treat these folks just like we do any seizure, ABCs. Look for the underlying cause. If they're pregnant, it's probably pregnancy, but think about head injuries, think about glucose issues, check a glucose, think about hypoxia, think about drug use, and obviously think about trauma, okay? The way we manage these is we're gonna do rapid airway management, open their airway, maybe a jaw thrust, nasal trumpet, OPA, supplemental oxygen, consider benzos, a couple of Versed's reasonable. <clears throat> and then we start thinking about, okay, chick's pregnant, seizing, probably has eclampsia, we need magnesium. Now in Alabama, magnesium for this is category B, all right, and the dose is four grams. <clears throat> I know that some agencies only carry two grams that we use for torsades. If you only got two grams, give two grams. Four grams is reasonable. In the ER, we give four to six grams IV mag. <clears throat> if we don't have IV access, if it's tough to get it, we'll give five grams of mag IM to each butt cheek. Um, works pretty good. <clears throat> Things to think about on magnesium and high doses of magnesium, you get a lower blood pressure. Most of the time with eclampsia, that's what you want. So you get magnesium, lowers the blood pressure, helps stop the seizures, and you're great. If you give too much magnesium and the BP drops too low, you can treat that with calcium. Obviously, that's going to be category B, and you probably won't see that in your career, but just FYI, I took that in the back of your head. All right. The way we treat this in the hospital is blood pressure control, IV magnesium, benzos as needed, airway management, look for a secondary cause like we talked about, <clears throat> and then you need to get the baby out. Baby comes out, usually folks do fine. Abruption is where the placenta tears away from the uterine wall, usually due to chronic hypertension, eclampsia, other issues will be cocaine use, meth use. It damages the placenta. Uh, other issues will be trauma. <clears throat> this causes pain because imagine this is like a big scab being torn off that uterine wall. So abdominal pain with or without vaginal bleeding in a pregnant person, especially with signs of hemodynamic, hemodynamic instability, you think <clears throat> abruption, okay? Placenta previa, I know y'all learned this in medic school, is where you have pain, this vaginal bleeding. In short, the placenta sets over the cervical opening. And as the uterus grows, the baby grows, and we get ready to deliver, the uterus tears, the uh, placenta tears away, and you get bleeding from the va uh, vagina. Uh, usually it's pain, this um, obviously breast bleeding from the vagina in a pregnant patient. We don't do an exam in the field, don't do an exam in the ER either, because if I if we dilate this more, what happens? We get more bleeding, right? This person needs to go to the OR and have a C-section at this point. Hyperemesis gravidarium. That sounds like something off Harry Potter, all right? Uh, but basically, this is nausea and vomiting in pregnancy that lasts excessively long. All folks get a little bit nauseous with that due to the beta HCG that increases. Some females are very unblessed, beta HCG. Um, and get extremely nauseated and dehydrated, and it kind of causes a, a big circle. So you have nausea, you get vomiting, you get dehydrated, you get ketosis. That makes you feel more nauseous. You vomit more, you get more ketosis. So it's a big cycle. So sometimes just antiemetics and IV fluids alone are not enough. A lot of times with these folks, we give them vitamin supplements to their IV. We also give them glucose to the IV to correct their ketosis because they're so malnourished and they feel better but this looks like a very uncomfortable thing to have happen to you. Spinal mobilization, uh, we don't do backboards anymore unless there's blunt trauma and you're paralyzed. Uh, if that's the case, obviously you can put them on the board, but roll them on the left side. You do not want to compress the vena cava. We talk about, um, do I have a slide for that? Uh, type in RH, 
basically in the hospital, we think about we want to get their blood type and are they are they negative or positive RH? <clears throat> and the reason we do that, because remember, <clears throat> for Mexico, O negative blood is a universal donor. O positive is a universal recipient. That's a good word. I'm from Mississippi. Forgive me. All right. So if mama is RH negative and baby is RH positive and there's some kind of abdominal injury, sometimes that fetal blood will cross over and get in mama's blood and mama builds antibodies against that. So we have to give them something called Rogam. OK, so pregnancy and blunt abdominal trauma and mama is O negative, A negative, B negative, any kind of negative, they get Rogam because it's really you can't tell until it's too late. There's some blood tests you can do to check for that, but sometimes those take too long in risk to benefit. You're better off giving the Rogam. All right. Remember bleeding. We can see it sometimes coming from the vagina. Sometimes with abruptions and uh, injuries, you can't see because the uh, cervix is still closed. All right. Any abdominal trauma from car wrecks, blunt trauma falls. After we work them up, if everything looks great, we monitor the baby for at least four hours to make sure they're fine. So even minor MBAs, pregnant chicks need to come to the hospital for evaluation. Here in Birmingham, we're lucky. A lot of the hospitals have OB triage rooms or MEUs. Those are great to go to after we evaluate them. So trauma needs to go to a regular ER. We work them up for life-threatening problems that are not related to the pregnancy or baby. If those are fine, they go to OB. If those are not fine, OB comes to us. <clears throat> so three stages of labor. First stage is contractions all the way up to cervical progression. Things I usually ask folks, is this your first pregnancy or your second or your third or what? People who call you a 911 for help for contractions and it's their first baby, you usually have plenty of time to get to the hospital. OK, if they're on baby number six, it probably delivers before you even get there. But different stages of labor. As the baby progresses and moves down, you get cervical dilatation. And then the baby comes out. Third stage is placenta. Remember, this is part of delivery. If you're on scene, baby is delivered. Once baby is delivered, if you want to start moving toward the hospital and wait for the placenta, that's fine. Make sure the cord is clamped. Sometimes some gentle pressure helps. If mama is hemodynamically unstable, obviously you can start moving toward the hospital, but you need extra hands in the back of the ambulance to help deliver this placenta. Sometimes <clears throat> this placenta being retained, <clears throat> these vessels are attached, so this does not constrict down. You get a lot of bleeding. People can bleed out. Once the placenta comes out, <clears throat> this starts constricting, and you get hemostasis at that point in the game. <clears throat> assessment of the pregnant patient. Obviously, this is your first baby, your second baby, your third baby. When do your contractions can start? <clears throat> Have you had any trauma? Have you had any prenatal care? Any big gush of fluids? <clears throat> Time between contractions. If it's baby number four, I'm asked. Otherwise, I don't really care. Do you have the urge to push? If you do, don't push, right? The next thing you want to do is you want to look for crowning, all right? All right. Um, crowning means you're going to stay and deliver that baby at that point in the game. I got a few pictures here as well. Protocols from the state, things you want to ask, things you want to think about. But short, do not delay transport, especially if they had a previous C-section. If they have known multiple babies, if they have twins or triplets, <clears throat> if they have any abnormal presenting parts, arms, legs hanging out, OK, excessive bleeding, all right, or if they're really early in labor. So in short, quick assessment, ABCs, all right, look for crowning. If not crowning, you get in the truck, start your IV, and move that direction, all right? So from the beginning of the first, the start of the contraction to the start of the second contraction is when you time blows, okay? <clears throat> and for me personally, I don't have the patience to time lows, so I'm going to do Quick assessment, quick history, what baby is this, prenatal care, ever had a C-section before, any gush of fluids, quick vital signs, quick peak for crowning. If they're not crowning, you're moving toward the hospital. With deliveries, you either need an OB surgeon or you don't, right? So most deliveries do well without any help, uh, but if you need help, you need a surgeon. So if you have a foot that's sticking out, a breech presentation, if the baby's stuck, if the baby is... Uh, 
Uh, becoming bradycardic, being stressed during delivery. It's hard for you to manage in the field with that stuff. They need an OB surgeon. Um, if mom is on the toilet when you get there, get them off. Look in the toilet before you do anything else. Make sure there's not a baby in there. All right. Very common. All right. Uh, and obviously uh, appropriate PPE. So crowning. All right. We don't do spectrum exams in the field. We don't do bimanual exams. We look to see if there's a baby coming. If there's a baby's coming, all hands on deck. We're going to deliver right here. If there's no crowning, we're going to get them back to the truck, get extra hands and head toward the hospital. The best way to learn how to deliver a baby is do that, just like anything else. It's tough getting clinical time for our basic medics. It's really, really hard to get experienced medics back into OB to get deliveries. There are a lot of videos you can watch, get prepared, but the only way to do this is to do several of them, okay? So just some cartoons. So baby's crowning at this point in the game. I'm gonna have my partner starting the IV on this patient. I got gloves and appropriate PP on. My hand is gonna be over the uh, baby's head as it's crowning to kind of slow descent. So if it pushed out real fast, we don't get tearing. I'm gonna slow the descent. As the head is delivered, old school was that we would go ahead and start to suction with a bulb syringe. If you have that, if that's what you're comfortable doing, that's fine. If not, you just want to wipe the baby's face. That's what we're doing in the hospital now. Wipe with your glove, wipe with a towel. Just kind of clear that uh, outer airway. Help normal progression. Hands over the head. I try to get one hand almost down to the vaginal opening, supporting the baby's body as the baby's coming out. As Soon as the baby is out, I'm clamping the cords two places. I'm putting the baby on top of mama, all right? If baby's screaming, kicking, yelling, Life is great. Baby's next to mama. If baby is flaccid, floppy, not doing well, I'm going to draw them off even more aggressively as I clamp the cord, all right, and hopefully stimulate them to start moving around. If they start moving, ventilating well, they go on mama. If they don't, either you or your partner got to resuscitate that kid, and then somebody's got to finish taking care of this mom, okay? Things that would bite you sometimes is you have a baby delivered, and mom says, oh, I'm only 18 weeks. Baby comes out, looks like a baby. Baby's unresponsive. <clears throat> 18 weeks is not going to survive outside the womb. But sometimes parents don't know those dates. So I would recommend resuscitation on that infant as best you can so that uh, next day you hear a hey, baby was actually 26 weeks. If you don't resuscitate, you're going to feel bad. OK, now, obviously, babies that are born that are unresponsive, blue, probably a bad outcome long term anyway. But again, uh, the right thing to do is resuscitate that baby. And I can tell you, I've seen babies born at 12, 14 weeks that look like real babies, look like people, okay? They're just too small to survive. They'll come out breathing, moving. Um, those folks still, they come out, you clamp the cord, dry them off, you put them on top of mama, you let mama bond as much as they can, and then you move toward the hospital. Fundal massage, so post-delivery, there's a lot of bleeding. You want to get that uterus in the uterus. You want to get the placenta out, general traction. And then you want to do good pressure, good firm pressure over the, uh, the uterine fundus to get those muscles to constrict, contract, and stop that bleeding, right? Obviously, if you have a lot of major bleeding post-delivery <clears throat> and you're doing fundal massage, it's not getting better. There's a new drug out there we can give for this, which is... TXA, right? So we can do TXA. Just another quick go through of delivery. And again, there's no way to learn this online, guys. You need to watch it. Several on YouTube, they're out there. Okay. And then if you have access to do these in the field, do it. If you're still in school, make sure you get those clinical rotations as well. We kind of talked about this. So APGAR, um, you got to do the APGAR. If you don't, you get fussed at. My opinion, uh, this is something you figure out later. You're going to have this assessment in your head when you see the kid, but I'm not going to stop patient care and write down my APGAR, right? All right. Bleeding can be pretty significant. Remember, the body's already prepared for this. It's got extra blood stuff, uh, but fundal massage and be aggressive. They should almost have a bruise on their belly after you do this correctly. If you ever watch the OB docs do it, it makes me uncomfortable. They do internal and external fundal massage, okay? If they're hypotensive and tachycardic, all right, IV fluids, consider TXA. So TXA is great 
post-delivery, TXA. Don't give it when they're pregnant, but once the baby is out, they're no longer pregnant. And if they're bleeding, they can get TXA. <clears throat> that is going category A in June, one gram and 100 cc's of fluid. Placenta comes out, transport that with mom, throw it in a bag, throw it in a bucket so we can look at it at the hospital. It will give us some idea if they're retained products or not. In reality, they all get an ultrasound anyway, but that's fine. So we talked a little bit about premature rupture of membranes. Obviously, you show up on scene 30 weaker who has a gush of fluids, quick assessment, vital signs, speed of heart tones if you can. Look for crowning. If not crowning, crowning, then go to the hospital. There are things we can do if they have a rupture of membranes. Sometimes OB can go in and put fluid back in the uterus and do a cerclage or sew up the cervix and they can go to full delivery and that's pretty good for the kids. Uterine rupture is uncommon, but basically the uterus with the baby inside of it, little baby, if they've had a previous C-section for delivery, they got a big stretched out uterus, thinned out muscles, almost gravid, they start getting contractions, this can tear, and then you see a deformed abdominal wall, maybe a hand or a foot underneath it, uh, very bad, and then you go to the OR right now. Risk factors will be previous C-sections, age, maternal age, baby's age, underlying risk problems. Prolapse cord. I have one question. Oh, yes, sir. Sorry. Uh, they had a question. Pressure or circular motion? I would do both. So direct pressure for a few minutes and then rub. The goal is you want to make that muscle get irritated, all right, so it can stretch down. So I do both. So I'm going to usually make a fist, and I got my fist almost in the belly putting weight down to rub that. Then when my hand gets tired, I'm going to open up and use my hand and rub it and trade out with the other partners, okay? If they're having pretty good bleeding, you want to be aggressive with this. The patient's not going to appreciate it, uh, but it's almost like a tourniquet. You got to do what you got to do. <clears throat> Prolapse cord, what you want to do, sterile gauze. Maybe put a finger, your hand under this to lift it up. If it has a pulse, then you know that the baby's probably getting blood supply. Rapid transport and nothing else to do. If there's no pulse, this is the only time you put a couple of fingers inside and try to lift the cord up to get a pulse back. If not, there's not much else you can do in the field, right? So you haul butt, all right? And this is one that you call in a head. You're probably going in the Birmingham area to an OB triage area that the triage, uh, the, the ER nurse know. Uh, what's going on? If you're going to UAB, you're going to our uh, separate uh, OBER. Call ahead and the know as well. They can actually meet you on that first level. There's a resuscitation and a surgical suite right there. They can do things. Uh, they don't do, no. So, yes. Right. You need to go to a, yeah. So, if you got this, you need a, you need an ER doctor. If this came to my ER, I can't fix this. I do C-sections on people that are are dead. It's a last just ditch effort. So, effort. So this person needs to go to a place that has OB services. Yes, sir. Yes, sir. We kind of talked about that. Deliveries. Good news, bad news. <clears throat> good news if you see a breach. Most of the time, these folks are premature. It's younger people. Uh, and a lot of times, these breaches on people that aren't <clears throat> don't know they're pregnant uh, they come out okay, they be smaller. Bad news is that's not the case all the time. So if you got a foot or arm sticking out, this is a rapid transport to a place that has OB services as well, because if you can't get them out breached, they need surgery. And there's no way for you guys to tell in the field. And even me in the ER, um, you know, the last breach I delivered is I'm looking at the foot sticking out and getting ready to start delivery. I'm also on the phone with OB. I need you in the ER right now, or I need you 10 minutes ago. Nuchal cord, that's where the cord is wrapped around the baby's head. <clears throat> in theory, same thing. You want to get a finger under there, try to wrap it over <clears throat> the uh, uh, baby's head, get it off the neck. Uh, if not, it's going to have to be cut as well. And again, these are things you got to practice. And the way you, only can, way you can practice these things you can't do clinically is watch a lot of YouTube videos. Be prepared in your mind. What are you going to do? How are you going to act with that? Intact amniotic sac, very rare, but in short, I don't think I have a picture of that. No, I don't. But in short, the baby is born and the sac is intact. You see it, some with C-sections, 
very, very rare with vaginal deliveries. But if the baby comes out still in the amniotic sac, don't leave them in the sac. Remember the placenta is being unattached. They're not gonna get blood supply. So gently tear that, open them out, resuscitate the kid, okay? Meconium, we used to do a lot of talks about meconium. In reality, all we do now is kind of wipe the face. If the patient needs to be intubated, then we think about deep suctioning with ET tube, uh, but that's not gonna happen in the field for the most part. Multiple pregnancies, obviously that's a high risk, getting the movement toward the hospital. Uh, hemorrhage control, postpartum, we talked about TXA use, post-delivery, other big embolisms. Remember, that with the venous congestions, they're high risk for PEs, you can see that. And then if they have a acute respiratory failure, hypoxia during delivery, you think about amniotic fluid, not super uncommon. We talked about TXA already. I'm going to talk a little bit about, this is just another slide that talks about anatomy. So this is the, the ovary. This is the fallopian tube. You see there's a lot of big vessels there. So in a topic pregnancy here, if that ruptures, it's going to damage these blood supply. You get a lot of bleeding pretty quick. The other thing you see here is that the ovaries to the fallopian tube, they're not touching. So that egg comes out, goes through the peritoneal cavity just a little bit into the tube. All right. So that means there's a direct pathway from vagina to cervix, fallopian tube to the abdominal cavity. So some things can cause peritonitis in folks. So <clears throat> a couple of cases, 16 year old female, acute onset abdominal pain, <laughs> bad pain, <laughs> left lower quadrant after jumping on a trampoline, okay? So that's a classic textbook picture of ovarian torsion. So you think about uh, young, thin female, menstruating may have a cyst that makes these ovaries a little bit heavier she's jumping this twist twist it cuts off the blood supply and it's sort of like a testicular torsion except it's inside it's ovarian torsion okay if we don't correct this in a couple of hours she loses this ovary which is a big life-changing event from a 16 year old right so <clears throat> ovarian torsion all right this is a female history of a cyst. She's got a fever, tachycardic, abdominal pain, and vaginal discharge. So this is somebody you think about has a cervical infection or vaginitis. It could be an STD. But again, the problem is if you get a STD where you get a vaginal infection, that infection can actually get in the uterus, infect the uterus. That infection can go out into the peritoneal cavity and you get peritonitis. It's called pelvic inflammatory disease. And this is very bad. This scars up the fallopian tubes for later in life, and people can die from this. So STDs are bad for everyone, uh, but guys do better because we don't have an opening to our peritoneal cavity like females. So we're pretty aggressive in treatment of STDs in females because of the risk of infertility and the risk of death. So 30 year old female, nausea, volume, abdominal pain, positive whole pregnancy test, but she said she had her tubes tied. So your first thought is you have an ectopic pregnancy, okay? So she gets IV access, all right? If she is hemodynamically unstable, she gets TXA in the field and you get to the hospital and you let whoever you're taking this patient to know that you got a woman of childbearing age who had a home pregnancy test, who had a BTL, any reasonable trained physician is going to say that's an ectopic until proven otherwise. We're going to do a quick preg test in the ER and call OB. If this patient showed up to me where I'm working and she's hypotensive, I'm going to call OB anyway before I get a pregnancy test. I'm going to get a quick ultrasound. If I see fluid in her belly, my diagnosis is made and she goes to the OR. It's just like a GSW. Remember, these vessels are really, really big. If this ruptures, people die. And our goal is not to let people die if we can prevent it. This is a 40 year old female weak dizzy. Um, she had a hysterectomy done several months ago and has a lot of belly pain and bleeding post having sex. She's tachycardic, she's pale, she looks ill. When you do a hysterectomy, you take out this, sometimes the ovaries, all right? But all these blood vessels are still around. You put a little cuff, there's a sheet, we kind of sew this up but they're big blood vessels there, all right? And if she has vaginal trauma, you can tear that cuff 
and rip these blood vessels and people can bleed out and die pretty quick. I've heard people say, yeah, but she's not having vaginal bleeding. Not a big deal. Yeah, but you can have bleeding where? Into the abdomen as well. So they get a vaginal exam in the ER to look for injuries, but they also get an ultrasound. In the field, they would get TXA, and they go to the OR to get that fixed because people can die from that. How are we doing on time? I know I spent way too much time. Five minutes. All right, so quick update. So COVID, American Heart put this out back on April 9th. This is CPR, ACLS for known or suspected COVID. So things you want to think about here is they're talking about early intubation. And this is something we've been doing at Centerpoint for a long time. Remember, my, my thoughts on all cardiac arrest is all cardiac arrest cannot be clumped into one category. If I got a four-year-old male that's jogging, that grabs his chest and falls over, bystander starts CPR and we get on scene and he's in V-fib, that's probably his problem. He probably doesn't need a quick airway. He needs CPR and defibrillation. We're still going to get an airway on him, okay? All right. Versus the 48-year-old with COPD that goes into cardiac arrest from respiratory failure, that person needs early intubation and ventilation because they are already hypoxic and having respiratory problems, okay? And if you just bag them or do a King or IGEL, they're not going to get better anyway. So cardiac arrest cannot all be lumped into one big patient category. That being said, American Heart is pushing really hard for early intubation with appropriate PPE and su suspected COVID arrest. But the caveat to that is you need to use a video laryngoscope that keeps you away from the patient's head. So if you're an agency that's not using a video laryngoscope, the time is now to get those. It is time to get that. It keeps your providers away from the face of these patients, okay? So you can look on the BRIMS webpage that talks about this. There are some guidelines about withholding, or not withholding, of stopping CPR as you intubate someone. I think in a known respiratory arrest, that is a reasonable approach. It goes against all better judgment that we've been doing for the past several years, but reasonable approach. However, if you have appropriate PPE on and you have a video scope, there's no reason to change what you're doing. So again, my big push for this was Guys, it's time to get video the laryngoscopes. There are several in the market now that are reasonable. I don't sell them. I don't make money off of them. UB Scope has some that are pretty cheap. McGrath has them. Stores is probably the better one in the market, in my opinion, but it's way too expensive for most people. But it's time to get a video scope to protect you and your providers. All right, I think we're about out of time. Uh, any questions, shoot us an email. Um, don't forget, Alabama EMS Challenge is where you send your email to to get your certificate today. Try to do that by two or three this afternoon if you can. Next class will be the second Wednesday. Uh, I don't have a calendar in front of me. So the second Wednesday of next month, whatever that is. All right. I'll post Cadaver Lab as soon as we have it available. And any May 13th. All right, May 13th, we'll do an EKG review. And I'm not sure what the next topic is, but we'll have something for you. I'll post it on Facebook and at Brims uh, by the end of the week. Reach out with questions. Thanks for tuning in. Thanks, guys. Don't forget the password for today is OB and check out our YouTube channel, EMS Challenge. YouTube channel. Thank you. Back out. Here we go.